All right, the title of the sermon tonight is Seek the Kingdom First. Seek the Kingdom First. In the chapter we've read, there's a lot to cover there. And you might notice that one of the key themes in that chapter was the kingdom of God, right? Even, even the, you know, sowing the seed was referred to as, as the seed of the kingdom, if you notice that. But Matthew 6, 33 says, But seek ye first, so this is our instruction by Jesus Christ, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. So what's our instruction? Seek ye first the kingdom of God, right? And a lot of people sometimes forget, and his righteousness. All right? It's good to go and sow the seed of the kingdom. It's good to be doing the works of the kingdom. But at the same time, you shouldn't be living your evil, you know, fleshly life. You know, it's his kingdom and his righteousness. Those two things go together. That's the main goal that we have in our lives, right? Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. All those things come together. We know we ought to love the Lord with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. And, you know, all these things come together. That's the key thing for us, to seek his kingdom and his righteousness. Now, one of the interesting things is this. For the longest part of my Christian life, I did not understand the kingdom of God. Okay? For the longest part of my Christian life. And I'd read something like this, seek ye first the kingdom of God. And I'm thinking about, yeah, I, 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 I want to seek it, but I don't even know it. Like, what is the kingdom of God? Because there is so much teaching out there, so much confusion, so much... Uh, different ideas of what the kingdom of God is. And, you know, you bring dispensationalism into this. They've got their own ideas of what the kingdom is. And I just want to cover very quickly, I know I covered this very briefly in one of my previous sermons. I thought this would be a good sermon to cover after we've preached on, you know, the millennium and, and the new heavens and the new earth and end times, because this does tie in with the end times as well. Um, not, it's not the main thing about that I want to cover today, but I just want to give you guys an understanding of the kingdom. Nothing that I'm preaching t- tonight is brand new. Everything that I'm preaching tonight, I've heard from somewhere, but in bits and pieces. A bit here, a bit there, a bit there. I've never really heard it organized until I did my own research and my own study. You know, wiped the slate clean and just started all over again. Okay, I'm not teaching you any new doctrine. I'm just teaching you an organized doctrine, if that makes sense. Okay, it's, it's, I've organized it in a way that makes a lot more sense. And I think it's very simple to, to see this once, you know, I've taught you this. Now, first thing I want you to understand is that there are different people, you know, we talked about the millennial kingdom of Christ. We, we said we're pre-millennial, we believe Christ is coming back before his millennium kingdom, and that's a physical, literal kingdom upon this earth. Literally, a thousand years is going to rule and reign from this earth. But there are different positions on what people consider the millennium, okay? That thousand year period. Now, as a pre-millennial, there are two positions in the pre-millennial movement. Number one, it's the historic pre-millennialism. Okay, historic premillennialism. This is what we believe, basically. We believe that the millennium, millennial kingdom is a future event. It hasn't started yet. We believe that Christ is coming back to establish that kingdom in the future. And we believe that Christians will be raptured after the tribulation. Okay? Now, there's another group of premillennialists, okay, very similar to us. They're called the, it's called the dispensational premillennialism. Okay, dispensational premium. Same thing. They believe there's a literal thousand-year kingdom to come. They believe Christ is going to come back before that millennial kingdom up on this earth, but they believe they're going to be raptured before the tribulation. Okay? That's the key difference. Now, there's two other positions. Uh, there's post-millennialism. Post-millennialism. Um, a lot of the uh, <coughs> Protestants are post-millennial. Um, the idea is basically that they believe that Christ will come after the millennial kingdom. And you, you go, well, how, how's that? You know, isn't that his kingdom? Well, they believe the millennial kingdom is now. They believe the period that we live in right now is the kingdom of God, is the millennial kingdom of God. Okay? Now, they believe that... Um, well, actually, I don't know if they Anyway, they believe, the people that believe this, believe that Christians in this world is going to, are going to Christianize the whole world. It's going to be this Christian utopia. Every nation's going to worship the Lord. Every nation's going to lift up his name. And once that's done, once that mission is accomplished, you know, what we would call call the millennium, because everyone's, you know, worshipping, like, everyone's at least under the authority of Christ. Once that's accomplished, they believe Christ is coming after that to create the new heavens and the new earth. Okay? Now, obviously, we take it literally that it's a thousand years. And for them, they couldn't say it's a literal thousand years. Maybe a thousand years ago, they thought it was a literal thousand years. But after, after, you know, Christ, you know, because it's 2,000 years since Christ, they have to recognize, okay, it's not a thousand years. Or it's a spiritual application. You know, the millennial thing is a spiritual teaching. It's not a literal teaching. 
And uh, that's why I reinforce in my sermon on, on Sunday how many times it says a thousand years, right? A thousand years this, a thousand years that, a thousand years that. Now, it's very easy to debunk this um, teaching and it's starting to lose its popularity. But one of the verses is 2 Timothy chapter 3. You don't need to turn there, I'll just read it to you. 2 Timothy 3, chapter, chapter 3, verse 1. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. These people are, is the description of the last times. <laughs> So I don't know how you get this idea that we're going to create this Christian utopia. It's going to be wonderful when, we get, when we're taught that, no, in the last days, it's going to be wicked. In the last days, it's going to be horrible. In the last days, people are proud, boastful of themselves. A form of godliness. They, they have religion. They have their God in their mind, but they fall way short of that. And we are told to turn away from people like that. Okay, so it's very easy to debunk. And I think that's why it's losing its popularity. Then the fourth position on the millennial kingdom is our millennialism. You know, it's kind of like when you put a, like an atheist, you know, they don't believe in God. A theist believes in God and an atheist doesn't believe in God. Well, millennial people believe in a literal millennium. There are millennial, they don't believe in a literal millennial kingdom, right? It's, it's all spiritual to them. Now, it's not that they completely disregard it. They obviously see it in the Bible and they have to have an answer for it. It's just that they believe it's this spiritual kingdom. When Christ was resurrected, went back to heaven, he's ruling and reigning from heaven, and again, we're in the millennium, but it's a spiritual millennium. They don't believe we're going to necessarily have this Christian utopia upon this earth. It's all spiritual, okay? And you can see why, you know, you can see why they sort of, um, they believe this, because, like, why they believe it's all spiritual and, you know, uh, not literal, because, you know, it's been past a thousand years since Christ, so they can't take it literally anymore. But one of the things they teach is that Satan is bound right now. Because if you know your Bibles, if you remember Sunday, Satan is cast into the bottomless pit before the thousand years commence, and so he can't deceive any nations, right? So they believe, because they believe this is the millennium now, they believe Satan's already cast into the bottomless pit and is not deceiving the nations. That's crazy. I mean, again, that's so easy to debunk. You know, just, just Ephesians 6, 11 put on the whole armor of God. So Ephesians, written to the Ephesian church, written after Christ was resurrected and went to heaven, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the, of the devil. <laughs> right? Why would you need to put the armor on if the devil's bound and not deceiving the nations, right? Put it on so we can stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual weakness in high places. And again, I could show you so many verses, obviously, of our battle with the devil, with Satan on this earth. Satan roaring around as a, as a, uh, how's it going to say? Huh? Walking around as a roaring lion, seeking whom, whom he may devour. So he's obviously roaming the earth, seeking to who he may devour. So, you know, it's very easy to debunk that. But, the reason why our millennials believe this, I'll just read to you John 18, 36. Uh, Jesus answered, my kingdom, this is what Jesus said, you guys might remember this, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews, but now is my kingdom not from hence. You know, so my kingdom is not from here, not from hence. So that's say, see, it's not a literal physical kingdom on this earth. Jesus said his kingdom is not from here. Right? That's, how they, that's the verse they use to sort of teach this. But they've misrepresented what Jesus is saying there. Okay? I'll just read it again, because it's going to tie into the rest of it. My kingdom is not of this world. That's what Jesus is saying. The source of his kingdom, where his kingdom comes from, is not from the earth. Obviously, he has a heavenly kingdom. If, the kingdom, if my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight, that I should not be delivered to the Jews, but now is my kingdom not from hence, not from here. You know, that whole Christian utopia idea, you know, we're going to bring the kingdom of Christ ourselves and then Christ will come. No, it's not from here. It's not going to come from here. Christ's kingdom comes with him from heaven. It's a heavenly kingdom. That's why sometimes it's referenced as the kingdom of heaven because the source of it is not a kingdom of earth. It's the kingdom of heaven. But then it is established upon this physical earth. Now, the dispensationalists, 
dispensational premillennialists. Okay, they agree with us that it's a future millennial kingdom, so we're on the same page there. But what they then teach, and again, look, I, I struggle with this because I, I was trying to understand the kingdom of God. I'd see all these verses seemingly contradictive, and I couldn't get my head around it. Okay, and my problem was I was trying to find the answers from people, from books from sermons. I should just go into the Bible. Just, 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 Lord, help me understand this, right? And eventually I had to do that and the Lord did help me understand this. But they teach, they teach there's a difference between the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God, okay? They teach that the kingdom of heaven is just for the Jews, just for the Jews, just for Israel. And the kingdom of, of heaven, that's for the, for the New Testament church. That's what they teach. Now turn to um, Matthew chapter 4. You guys turn to Matthew chapter 4, verse 17. Now, when I first came across this teaching, it was in my, in my first independent fundamental Baptist church, okay? And I was doing a course on, they call it Bible hermeneutics, which is Bible interpretation, understanding the Bible. Um, and I was excited when they told me, oh, the kingdom of heaven's for the Jews, the kingdom of God is for the church. I was excited. I was like, awesome, now I get it. I've been trying to find this answer. You know, I remember, I think, going to someone saying, oh, isn't it so good? to know the truth, and, uh, you know, I went to my Bible. I went to my Bible trying to um, find this. You know, I was, I was thinking that every time I read the kingdom of heaven, I'm going to find that it's about Israel. And I'm thinking that I'm, every time I read about the kingdom of God, I'm going to find it's about the New Testament church. Only to be disappointed, right? You hear things, it sounds wonderful, you know, you can parrot it as much as you want, but then you take it to the Bible and it falls short, <laughs> right? It, it just collapses, right? And I remember just being disgruntled, being frustrated. It's kind of like the pre-trib rapture. You know, you hear wonderful things, you go back to the Bible, all right, it's not there. <laughs> Same thing with the king, this kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven stuff, right? So let me just show you that there is no difference. There is no difference with the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God. And it's so easy to prove. You guys are in Matthew chapter 4. Read, uh, let's read verse 17, Matthew 4, 17. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, what does it mean to be at hand? It means it's close by, right? It's, it, it's about to happen. It's about to come. You know, it's within reach, right? The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, let me just, let's just pause here for a moment. Jesus says it's about to come. And then what dispensationalism teaches is that, well, it was postponed, because the nation of Israel rejected Christ. So because they rejected Christ as their king, Jesus had to postpone the kingdom of heaven. But Jesus is saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's around the corner. Get ready for it. Was he lying? You know, was he at the mercy of, of, of unbelieving Israel to decide when he's going to bring in his kingdom? Now I'll read to you Mark 1, 14. So you guys stay there so you can sort of see along. Uh, now, after that, John was put in prison. Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God <clears throat> and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. So hold on. Is, which one's coming at hand? Is it the kingdom of heaven at hand or is it the kingdom of God at hand? Are these two different kingdoms both at hand? It's the same kingdom. It's the same passage. This is the parallel passage, passage of parallel teaching on the kingdom. Look at Matthew 5, 3. Matthew 5, verse 3. Matthew 5, verse 3. The Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, verse 3, it reads, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Right? You might be poor on, upon this earth, hey, but you can be greatly blessed and greatly encouraged if you're saved to have the kingdom, being someone, a child of the kingdom of God. Let me read to you Luke 6, 20. But he lifted up his eyes on his disciples and said, Blessed be ye poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Right? Same thing, same teaching, parallel passage, Sermon on the Mount. It's just recorded differently. You know, maybe he preached it multiple times. Sometimes he said heaven, sometimes he said God. What have you? You know, it doesn't, it's the same teaching. Right? There's no difference. You guys are in Matthew. Turn to Matthew 13. Matthew 13, verse 10. Matthew 13, verse 10 and 11. <clears throat> so we were actually, this was where we were reading from in the chapter. Matthew 13, verse 10. And the disciples came and said unto him, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? He answered and said unto them, Because it is given uh, unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. 
I'll read the parallel passage in Mark chapter 4, verse 10. But when he was alone, they were about him with the twelve. Uh, they that were about him with the twelve asked of him the parable, and he said unto them, Unto you it is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God, but unto them that are without, all these things are done in parables. Okay, it's the same thing, right? Same thing. Uh, and I'll even read to you from Luke, because Luke captures this event as well. Luke eight nine, and his disciples asked him, saying, What might this parable be? This parable be. And he said, Unto you it is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God. But to others in parables, that seeing they might not see, and hearing they might not understand. Okay? Now turn to Matthew 19. Matthew 19. Matthew 19, verse 23. Matthew 19, verse 23. And this is the best one. Like, if, if you're trying to convince someone that these two things are exactly the same thing, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of the same thing, turn to Matthew 19, 23, and just show him this. And this is the story of the young rich ruler coming to Christ. He wouldn't sell his riches, remember? And then um, we, we pick up the story in verse 23. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, Verily I say unto you, that a rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. So is it hard for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven? Yes, hardly. It's not impossible, it's just very hard. Okay? And we, we see that, we go so winning, the more they have, the more possessions they have, the nicer their house, the more material they have, the, the, the greater chance that they're going to you know, reject the gospel. But then look at verse 24. And again, and again, what does that mean? Once more. I'm saying, to you, you, saying this to you again. Is he saying something else? Is he saying something different? No, he says, and again, the same thing that I just said to you. And again, I say unto you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. So in the same passage, it's hard for both, you know, the, kingdom, the, the, the rich man to go into the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. Why? Because he's saying the same thing again. You know, just saying it slightly differently. It's kind of like if you instruct your kids, you might say, you know, um, I don't know, I, I might say to my kids, you know, um, you know, can you make me a coffee? And then I might bring him back and say, oh, you know, make sure you don't make me a tea or, you know, you, know, you might rephrase something twice to make sure your child understands. And so, God, you know, Jesus is making it very clear to them that a, a rich man can't enter into the kingdom of God, right? And he says it both ways, so we can see that these things are parallel. They're exactly the same thing. Verse 25, When his disciples heard it, they were exceedingly amazed, saying, Who then can be saved? But Jesus beheld them and said unto them, With men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. I just want you to notice there, because he's talking about the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven, and the disciples ask, Who then can be saved? So we see the correlation with salvation and the kingdom of God, okay? These things go hand in hand, salvation and the kingdom of God. Now, let me just show you some inconsistencies, right? And what I mean by inconsistencies, I'm just saying these are passages that people struggle with and come up with all these crazy teaching, okay? Uh, you're, you're still in Matthew, so turn to Matthew chapter 3, verse 1. Matthew chapter 3, verse 1. Matthew chapter 3, verse 1. The Bible reads, In those days came John the Baptist preaching that in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Okay? So we see John the Baptist saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He's saying it's about to come. And then Jesus in Matthew 4, 17. Actually, I think we, we read this already. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Okay? So it's around the corner. It's coming. All right? Then uh, Matthew chapter 10, verse 5. Matthew 10, verse 5. I'm getting you to turn here just because I know you're in Matthew, so it's just easy. Matthew chapter 10, verse 5. These twelve Jesus sent forth, so the disciples, and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as ye go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. So John the Baptist, Jesus, and the disciples all preaching, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Were they all mistaken? No, they were teaching the truth. This is a reality. The kingdom of God at this point in time was about to come. All right? Why? Because the king was there. The king of kings was there on the earth. Now, not only was it coming or at hand, but if you read your Bible, it did come. Okay, so turn to Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12, verse 28. Matthew chapter 12, verse 28. 
Matthew 12, 28. Jesus speaking, But if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God... So did Jesus cast out devils by the Spirit of God? Yes. All right. But if I did that, then the kingdom of God is come unto you. So was Jesus casting out devils by the Spirit of God? Yes. If that's true, then the kingdom of God is come unto you. It's here. Jesus is saying, it's right here. The kingdom of God is here. I'm casting out the devils by the Spirit of God, by the power of God. Now, I'm just going to read some other passages to you here. Luke 17 verse 20 says, And when he was demanded of the Pharisees, when the kingdom of God should come. So the Pharisees are saying, when's it coming? When's the kingdom of God coming? He answered them and said, The kingdom of God cometh not with observation. So it's not something you can see. All right? Neither shall they say, Lo here or lo there. For behold, the kingdom of God is within you. Wow, that's interesting. It's within you. So if the kingdom of God is within you, has it come? Yes, right? Because every saved person that receives the seed, that's saved, the seed of the kingdom, the kingdom of God is in them. But do you, see, do you see how it doesn't come with observation, something you can't see? Now can you understand how people struggle with these things? Because there are those that, obviously like us, that believe that the millennial kingdom of Christ is physical, is literal, something we can observe and touch and, and see and reign and rule, you know, rule and reign with Christ with. But here it's saying it's not something you can see. So is the Bible contradictive? You, you can see the challenges people have and then they come up with crazy things. Look, all these things are true. The kingdom of God is something that... What, this is true. Okay? I'm not going to try to explain this away. It's true. The kingdom of God is something that cannot be seen or observed. And it is within you. But also we know it's coming right? in Christ. All these things are true. We need to understand how do we understand all these things you know, in truth. And that's why I want to organize it in a way to help you understand that. Um, <clears throat> Uh, sorry, kingdom of God is at hand. Oh, and I'll just read to you John 3, 5 and 6. You guys know this. Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, so he's saved, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. So how do we enter the kingdom of God? Salvation, being born of the Spirit, right? That which is born of the, the uh, flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is Spirit. So the way we enter into the kingdom of God today, the kingdom of God that was at hand when Christ preached, the kingdom of God which had come when Christ was doing his uh, ministry and, and, and casting out devils, and the one that is not observed and cannot be seen, is now, is when you're saved, the kingdom of God is in you. Okay? The kingdom is now. That's a truth. The kingdom does exist now. And that's why you have these amillennialists and these post-millennialists saying, the kingdom is now. And, and they say it's the millennial kingdom that's now. But you can see why. Because they read these passages and they can't understand it. They can't comprehend what's going on. And I understand why I was struggling to understand this when I'd read all these passages. So the kingdom of God is now. But also, the kingdom of God is still future. The kingdom of God is still future. Luke 21, verse 25. You can turn there if you want, if you're fast enough. Luke 21, verse 25. Luke 21, verse 25. I would start reading. To, uh, actually, let's read, read from 27. Luke 21, verse 27. Jesus says, And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with great power, sorry, with power and great glory. So when does Christ come in a cloud? At the rapture, right? That's still future, it hasn't happened yet. And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. So that's our physical salvation, our physical redemption in the new bodies. And he spake to them a parable, saying, the fig tree and all the trees, when they shall uh, shoot forth, ye see and know of your own selves that summer is now night hand. So likewise, when ye see these things come to pass, all the events of the tribulation, all that kind of stuff, in the context, know ye that the kingdom of God is nigh at hand. Well, hold on, Jesus. Didn't you just say you would already come? But now he's saying it's nigh at hand, right? When you see Christ come in the cloud. Now, this is truth as well. We can't explain this away. It's true. The kingdom of God is still coming. But we also know the kingdom of God is now, right, in you. Okay, it's still, but it's still coming. These things are true. You know, I'm not trying to confuse you. I'm just saying to you all these things are true. Okay? Um, turn to Luke 19, if, you, if you're ready in Luke. Luke 19, verse 11. Luke 19, verse 11. 
Now, remember they were saying the kingdom of God is at hand, like it's, it's, it's immediate, it's going to happen, it's imminent, that, that kind of thing. Luke 19 verse 11 says, And they heard these things, he, uh, sorry, and as they heard these things, he added and spake a parable because he was nigh to Jerusalem and because they thought that the kingdom of God should, appear, should immediately appear. So Christ was going to Jerusalem. They thought in their mind that the kingdom of God's going to come now. He's coming to Jerusalem. He's going to rule and reign. He's going to be the king, you know, of Israel, so on and so forth. But do you see how they thought that it should immediately appear, right? But then look at this in verse 12. He said, therefore, a certain, this is the parable, a certain noble man went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. And he called his ten servants and delivered them ten pounds and said unto them, Occupy till I come. Now this parable, I'm not going to keep going on it, but this parable is saying, Jesus is the noble man, right? He's saying he needs to go to a far country to receive unto himself a kingdom. Remember that the kingdom is not from here, not from hence. The kingdom is from heaven. So when he goes away to head back to, to the Father, where he is now, when he comes back, he comes with that kingdom. Okay, He comes ruling and reigning and establishes that millennial kingdom on this earth. But do you see how he says, occupy till I come. So just wait, just wait, and then I'm going to come and bring that kingdom that I'm going to get from that far country. So it's not something that's coming immediately as he was going into Jerusalem. All these things are true. Okay? I'm not going to be so smart and explain it away like many people do. Okay. And then, uh, and obviously we know about the millennial kingdom. We, we talked about that on Sunday. You know, Satan being bound for a thousand years, and we know that, you know, that's still to come. That's a future event to come. Christ hasn't been ruling and reigning here physically for a thousand years. And then there's also that the kingdom of God... Now, this is the thing about Christ's kingdom when he comes, it's a thousand years long, right? It's a future kingdom, but it's not eternal. It comes to an end. At the end of the thousand years, God creates new heavens and new earth. It's not an eternal kingdom, okay? It's a thousand year long period. But then there's an eternal kingdom, okay? There's eternity. And this is the truth. This is the truth as well. I'll just read it to you. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 23 to 24, it says, But every man in his own order, talking about the rapture, Christ the first fruits, so Christ was resurrected first, afterward they that are Christ at his coming, so that's our rapture when we receive our new bodies at his coming. Then, is, then cometh the end, pay attention now, then cometh the end when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father. When he, have sh- when he shall have put down all rule um, and all authority and power. So what he's saying is at the, when he comes and he has his millennial kingdom and he, everything's under his feet, right? Then he hands that kingdom over or delivers that kingdom over to God, even the Father. Okay? So we have now the new heavens and the new earth. We read about that in Revelation. And that is forever. That kingdom is forever. Okay? So we have three truths. The kingdom is here now. The kingdom is still future a thousand years, but then there's a kingdom that's eternal. All three truths. And it's all the kingdom of God. Okay? All the kingdom of God. Now, how do we understand this? You know, because you can see why people struggle, right? Well, go back to... Are you in Matthew? Maybe some of you are. Matthew 13. Matthew 13, the chapter that we we read. Remember, the great theme about Matthew 13 was the kingdom of God. And it wasn't, until, it wasn't until I understood. Because remember how he talks about all these parables and then he asks the disciples, do you understand? And they say, yay, Lord. So the key to understanding the kingdom is in this chapter. Okay? Now, Matthew 13, verse 31. And I think many times we read these parables and we just let it go over our heads. But pay attention. Matthew 13, verse 31. Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, the kingdom of heaven is like to a grain of mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field, which indeed is the least of all seeds, but when it is grown, it is the greatest among herbs and becometh a tree, so that the birds of the air come and lodge in the branches thereof. I want you to notice a few things. How does the kingdom of God begin? This mustard seed, right? This, this one, the, one of the smallest seeds that there are. So if I took that mustard seed before you guys came to the service and I just threw it onto the ground, would you see it? You wouldn't see it. You wouldn't even know it's there, right? But is it there? It's there, right? It's there. You just wouldn't know. But then that mustard seed becomes this tree. If I planted a tree when you guys came in, would you see the tree? It'd be pretty obvious, right? (laughs) Right? Um, But then that tree, what happens? 
these birds come and, and lodge in, in, the, in the branches, right? So even if I use that analogy, even before you come into the building, you're going to hear the birds flying, singing. It's going to be even more obvious than walking in and seeing the tree. Do you see how it develops? Starts as a mustard seed, becomes a tree, and then you have all these birds uh, lodging in its branches. My point is, there's a three-part process, a three, you know, uh, how do I say this? Development of the kingdom of God. There's the kingdom of God now. There's the kingdom of God millennial future, and there's the kingdom of God eternal. Three-part process in this kingdom. And then, it's not only that, but look at... Um, uh, sorry, uh, as I read from Matthew 13, verse 33. Matthew 13, verse 33. Another parable spake he unto them The kingdom of heaven is like unto leaven, which, what's leaven? It's like yeast, right? You're baking bread, you take yeast to, to have that bread develop. So the kingdom of God is like unto leaven, which a woman took and hid, so she hides it in that meal, she hides it in the flour, hid in three measures of meal till the whole was leavened. Now, is it a coincidence that it's three measures of leaven to leaven till the whole was leavened? So this bread needs three measures, okay, of this leaven in this meal for the whole to, be the, to, for the whole to grow. Do you see that? There's three parts to this. So we see that development take place. The threefold kingdom of God is described here in these parables. And I can show you, if we go through all those parables, I'll show, I can show you three parts to it in a lot of those. Um, but that's not, it's not only in the New Testament. It's also found in the Old Testament. Turn to Daniel chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2 verse 34. Daniel chapter 2 verse 34. You guys might know the story of King Nebuchadnezzar he had this dream of this statue, head of gold. I'm not going to go through it all. But each part of that statue represented a future kingdom to come with the head of gold representing his kingdom. And if you guys might remember his dream, that that statue was destroyed, right? Now, when we get to that part in the passage, uh, verse 34, Daniel chapter 2, verse 34, notice this. Thou sawest, thou sawest till that a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay and break them to pieces. Then was the iron, the clay and the brass, the silver and the gold broken to pieces together and became like the chaff of the summer freshen, freshen floors. And the wind carried them away that no place was found for them. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. My point is, once it's talking about the, um, the kingdoms of this earth, you know, ruling and reigning, there's a stone that gets cut away. That's the first part. It hits the feet of this statue, which is the next bit, which breaks it to pieces. And then it grows into this great mountain that covers, that fills the whole earth. Even in the Old Testament, we see this three-step process of the king. And by the way, that stone, that mountain, represents the kingdom of God. Okay? And so I just want to show you that even in the Old Testament, we see this three-part process in the kingdom of God. Now let me just show you some other interesting things. So the kingdom of God is now... Like a mustard seed, can't be seen. You enter into the kingdom through salvation. Then the kingdom of God comes like this tree, right? And by the way, this, I don't know if you guys know this, but a mustard seed cannot become a tree. It's a miracle, right? Christ is not teaching science here, but he's explaining that this mustard seed, like they, they become these large, normally these, uh, kind of like these big weeds kind of thing. I can't even think of it right now. But then it becomes this tree because it stands out from that mustard seed. Right? And that's Christ's kingdom. It's going to come. It's going to come as this tree. It's going to be obvious. It's going to be visible. And then, once that tree develops, then you have the, the, the birds come to, you know, nest and, and, and you know, uh, and that, that represents the kingdom eternal. Right? The new heavens and new earth. New life, as it were. Now, some other interesting things about this three-part process of, Christ, of Christ's kingdom. If you can go back to Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12, verse 22. Because not only does God have a three-part process in his kingdom, but everything seems to happen in threes during, this, during the kingdom of God. Matthew 12, verse 22. Matthew 12, verse 22. Then was brought unto him one possessed with a devil, blind and dumb, and he healed them, insomuch that the blind and dumb both spake and saw. And all the people were amazed and said, Is this not the son of David? 
And when the Pharisees heard it, they said, This fellow doth not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of the devils. So the Pharisees are saying, This Jesus is a devil, right? He's using the power of the devil to cast out devils. And Jesus knew their thoughts and said unto them, Every kingdom, so he's talking about the kingdom of Satan here, every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. And if Satan casts out Satan, he is divided against himself, how shall then his kingdom stand? So we talk about the kingdom of God, we know it's coming, it's, it's here, it's, it's growing, but the, Satan has his own kingdom, you see that, right? Because Christ is casting out this devil, he refers to it as the Satan's kingdom. How can, his kingdom. how can Satan's kingdom stand if Satan is casting out Satan? You know, he wouldn't stand. And if I by Beelzebub cast out devils, by whom do your children cast them out? Therefore they shall be your judges. But if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God is come unto you. That's the verse we read before. Right? So the kingdom of God is come unto you. So I want you to notice this. The kingdom of God has come. Now, what was Christ doing? Casting out Satan's, you know, casting out Satan out of people. Casting out devils. What was he doing? He was um, basically, uh, how can I say, uh, taking over Satan's kingdom to an extent, right? He was demolishing Satan's kingdom because it wasn't Satan's kingdom destroying Satan's kingdom. It was the power of God destroying the kingdom of Satan, okay? So we see that first part when he comes, the kingdom now, he's casting out devils, upsetting the kingdom of Satan. Then, I want to go to the verses because you know this. When Christ comes and establishes the millennial kingdom, what happens to Satan? He's cast into the bottomless pit. It's like part two of, of his kingdom being destroyed, right? Part two, cast into the bronze pit, cannot deceive the nations for a thousand years. Then when the thousand years are over, before the new heavens and the new earth, the third part of, Christ, of God's kingdom, guess what happens? Satan's loose out of that kingdom. He's able to deceive some nations. They go against Christ. Now he's cast into the lake of fire. Christ destroys him with fire from heaven and he's cast into the lake of fire, never more to ever deceive the nations. That's part three. That's the end of the kingdom of Satan. So as Christ's kingdom grows we see Satan's kingdom being demolished and become to the point where it's nothing. It's a three-part process to Satan's kingdom being destroyed as well. Also, what's interesting about this, the kingdom of God being in three parts is obviously we know of the Trinity, you know, God in three persons. And what do we have as far as the kingdom now? To enter into Christ's kingdom, we're born of the Spirit. We have the Holy Ghost indwelling us, right? We haven't got Christ here physically upon this earth. We do have the Spirit of God who He promised to send, who the Father was going to send, indwelling the believer. You know, we're empowered by the Holy Ghost. We go and preach you know, the gospel through the power of the Holy Ghost. We have the Holy Ghost here with us. But then what happens when the millennium comes? Christ comes physically the second time, right? He comes. So we have the Holy Ghost and we have Jesus Christ on the earth. But we still haven't yet seen the Father, right? When do we see the Father? When, Christ, when God creates a new heaven and a new earth. That's when we see the Father. I'll just read it out to you in Revelation 22, verse 3. And there shall be no more curse, talking about the new heavens and new earth, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and His servants shall serve Him, and they shall see His face, and His name shall be on their foreheads. Now, how do I know that's the face of the Father? It's because the name of the foreheads, on the foreheads, is the name of the Father referenced in uh, Revelation seven i think i think so i have to go back and have a look at that um i didn't take it down but we're going to see the father's face because no man have seen the father right uh what did jesus say uh jesus said in uh what's my reference here? john 1 18 jesus said no man have seen god at any time the only begotten son which is in the bosom of the father he hath declared him so no one has seen the father but we have the holy ghost with us now in the millennium we're going to rule and reign with christ He'll be present with us, you know, at the rapture, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. We'll be with Christ. We'll have the Holy Spirit. And then in the millennium, we're going to see the face of the Father. We're going to see God in all His glory. God in His fullness. Okay? The full Godhead. And we're going to be able to receive that because we're in our resurrected bodies without sin. That's perfect. And, uh, you know, forgiven through the blood of Jesus Christ. Um, and the last thing I want to say to you, I'm sorry that I've gone a bit long today, but... We've also got the three resurrections, right? So where are we now? The kingdom of God that's here now. We're here through Christ, right? Christ died, was buried three days and three nights, rose again from the dead. Um, you know, he, he's the, the, the first fruits, right? The first fruits. 
And then he said, and then, ah, um, oh, I better turn there. I'm messing it up. 1 Corinthians 15. If you guys want to turn there. First Corinthians 15. <coughs> Verse 23. But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruit. So this is talking about the resurrection. Christ the first, he calls himself the first fruits. Okay, he's the first to be resurrected. He's the first to receive the resurrected body. And after he resurrected, he got, received the resurrected body, you know, he sent the Holy Ghost. Right? So we have that resurrection that takes place, that's available uh, in Christ, and we have the Holy Ghost here present, right? But then it says here, uh, afterward, they that, are at, they that are Christ at his coming. So before Christ set, establishes his millennial kingdom, there's that coming, the coming of Christ. We know that. And that's when he resurrects the saints. We receive the resurrected bodies. We, re, we are part of that first resurrection. And then it says this, then cometh the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he have shall put down all rule and all power, authority and power, for he must reign till he have put en all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. So at the end of the millennium, death and hell are cast into the lake of fire. That's the point that this is referring to. And the reason why death is destroyed is because there's that final resurrection that we read about in the, in the Revelation. Both the unsaved to the resurrection of damnation and then the saved. So you have this final resurrection of the saved at the end of the millennium before the new heavens and the new earth takes place. Do you see how everything takes place in threes in the kingdom of God? But the only way you're going to understand this, and, and to me, that's, that's easy. Now that I get it, it's actually easy to understand. The kingdom of God is something that grows. It's here now. It's invisible to most people. We know it's here because we're born of the Spirit. But then we see it in the future, in the millennium, when Christ comes. And then in its fulfilled fullness, when we see God in all his glory in the new heavens and the new earth. And you can see how, and I think I'm right. <laughs> like I said, I'm not teaching you anything that people haven't taught, bits and pieces, but I've never heard it organized. And you know what? To reach that point, you just have to believe the Bible. You just have to believe, oh, it's here now. Oh, it's, it's in the future. Oh, there's an eternal as well. <laughs> you just believe it, and then you work it out, right? You just believe the word of God. Let's pray. <clears throat>